200 years ago this month, 4,000 British soldiers lay siege to Washington, D.C. and set fire to the U.S. Capitol and the White House. And the burn marks on the White House walls are still there. We now have evidence of the char marks, the scorching that would have happened when flames were drawn out through open windows and doors and licked up around the tops of the stone. Jeez, this, William Allman this, is the White House curator. Is this the best evidence of the one time enemy forces were in our nation's capital? As far as I know. The burning of Washington was the darkest moment for the United States and President James Madison in the War of 1812, a sort of second war of American independence. The British had been interfering with American trade at sea and kidnapping sailors. American efforts to expand westward and north into Canada were being thwarted by the British. Two years into the war, with the Americans in retreat, British forces reached the nation's capital. What was Washington like in 1814? Miserable. Tiny, small, strung out. William Allen is historian emeritus for the architect of the Capitol. It was a construction site. It was a construction site, and there were stone yards and brick yards and kilns, and it was just a mishmash. The Capitol dome hadn't yet been built, but the original house chamber, located on the site of today's Statuary Hall, was an architectural masterpiece recreated in these digital images. Many people described it as the most beautiful room in America. It had this glorious ceiling with the 100 skylights. Was it a fireproof room? Uh, the room was fireproof except for the ceiling. And that, of course, was the Achilles heel of the room. The ceiling was wooden. And all they had to do, of course, is to catch the ceiling on fire when it fell down, the rest of the room would be destroyed. The heat was intense. The glass and the skylights uh, melted, became molten, and fell down in large Jeez. chunks. The Capitol's stone walls survived, as well as the Senate vestibule, with its distinctive corn cob columns. And what is the significance of the corn cobs? Well, the significance is the American plant uh, in a classical way, sort of thinking the way classical architects would have thought using this very important staple of the American diet and the American economy. And fighting with the British that night were former American slaves. You know, the British brilliantly exposed a real uh, weak side in American society, and that was slavery and our dependence on slaves. And Historian Steve Vogel is author of a blow-by-blow -blow account of Washington's capture. And they offered freedom to uh, slaves in this region, in the Chesapeake, said, you, you know, come over to our side, you know, we promise you freedom, and if you want to, by the way, you can fight against uh, your former masters. Moving from the capital, British Navy Rear Admiral George Coburn, Army Major General Robert Ross, and 150 Redcoats marched to the White House. So the British came right through here? Right through here. Not these steps, but this wall, this door. Again, White House curator Bill Allman and they walked in, and what do you think their first impression was? I think that it was a pretty good size house, but not a palatial one. Right. No uh, Buckingham Palace. No Buckingham Palace, no Versailles. Uh, that it was, you know, reasonably uh, well decorated. The biggest surprise? A dinner set for 40. So the British feasted in the White House dining room before burning the mansion down. Here, too, the walls survived, but little remains of what was once inside. What does is an American icon. This is the East Room, the largest room in the house. This is the room where Teddy Roosevelt's kids used to roller skate, right? Yes, on a floor that looks much like this one. And this is the room where Susan Ford had her senior prom, right? That's right. So, more importantly, this is the room with... This is the great full-length portrait of George Washington. Uh, by Gilbert Stewart. And this is the one that Dolly Madison rather famously saved. She had already packed up state papers, the red velvet drapes that she had put in the Oval Room. So then, kind of as a last minute thing, she says, oh, we've got to save General Washington. And she gave the instructions to get it off the wall, and it was bolted on. Hard to get off. So they had to pretty much cut the frame open and then, you know, lift the canvas out on its stretcher. And who did that? Uh, servants, the, the, the maitre d' and one of the, uh, the family slaves. 
Well, so. she was also busy cramming silverware into her purse, right? right? Yep. She was trying to save everything she could. She was leaving her personal things. As a rule, the British invaders didn't loot. But one soldier grabbed this. And this is believed to be Madison's personal little traveling medicine chest that was taken from the White House by one of the British troops, uh, later passed to a member of uh, one of the naval forces, and then uh, descended in his family until it was given to Franklin Roosevelt in 1939. Given back. Given back. And we're whispering right now because the current president is being interviewed right under us. Correct. Okay. After torching the White House, the British burned the buildings housing the Departments of State, Treasury, and War, concluding one of the most devastating days in American history. I mean, can you imagine the scene after the British have departed Washington? The Capitol and the, the White House are smoldering shells. Uh, the American army has abandoned the city. Nobody knows where President Madison or the cabinet are. It's really impossible to, to think of many more uh, despondent, desperate moments in American history. A Union Jack flew over the Capitol. It did. A lot of people felt that, you know, the, the young republic was coming to its end, that the American experiment was dying in its infancy. Fearing an American counterattack, the British occupation of Washington lasted only a day. Among its overlooked heroes, State Department clerk Stephen Pleasanton, who hid the Declaration of Independence in a Virginia mansion. Six months later, the war ended in a virtual stalemate, and British leader George Coburn returned home, where his portrait features Washington blazing in the background. And the very last question, you know I have to ask, if these walls could talk, what would they say? You know, the, the War of 1812 isn't that well known, but I think if these walls could talk, they'd say, well, we're certainly happy that we're still standing here, that we're still occupying this spot, and that the presidents have lived here 200 years since the fire. You know what I think they'd say? Ouch. <laughs>